Hello, this is Bill Merlo, and thanks for joining me on another video adventure. Now, what you're into is the series of video on our digital payment solutions, and this is such a big part of the club that we wanted to make sure that you completely understood it and were feeling very comfortable with it. I won't spend too much time right now, but as you know, we're creating a new global economy, actually a closed loop sharing economy uh, that is that you know everybody wins, and I think that becomes more apparent as you watch these videos. But this idea of having our own digital currency that's global and around the world is such an important part of what we have. It makes us unique, along with the fact that we have a club, along with the fact that we have uh, the membership the way we have it set up, and that we, you know, our merchants can come in for free, and we've got a residual rebate system where everybody wins, and once we hit a certain level, then everybody shares in it, and then we add on this global uh, digital currency program or the payment solutions so that we can go from country to country to country and work all together to make things happen in a big way. Let's just go ahead and talk about currencies in general. So let's talk about money. So first of all, early stages of money could have been anything. It was anything, livestock, skins, sacks of grain, shells, beads, anything that could be traded. But then it kind of turned into precious metals. Of course, that's when the gold standard came along. We had, used to have paper money because it became easier to transport, but it was backed by a precious metal. But in 1971, they removed all that about backing money with anything. And now what we have is fiat money. What that means is that it derives its value only from the government or regulation of law. And what happens is, is now the money supply is regulated by things like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, or other central banks around the world. So basically, the money is created from nothing, and it is a way of controlling the economy. Now, what is money for? Well, money is basically a medium of exchange. So money only has perceived value. And it's agreed upon that it has that value. And we use it to exchange for purchases of goods and services. Now, all of this is important and relative to our concept of digital currency. So the type of banking we have right now, the type of system we have right now, is a centralized financial system. What that means is we all have custodial accounts. That means our funds are all held in trust by the bank with a promise that it's available. Now, if you would think that you're going to go to a bank and you think you have $1,000 sitting there in the bank and that's yours and no one else can touch it, it's not the way it works. It just works that the bank is saying, when you come in, if you're telling us to have your $1,000 or we've done all the accounting to say that, it'll be here when you arrive. And that's because they have just a whole bunch of money, but they're moving it. In fact, in the last crisis, they moved it too often and banks can turn that money over 20, 30, 40 times and you know, start to make a lot of money from the money that you have sitting in the bank. Anyway, that's a different topic. But these people are all called trusted third parties. Now they're needed in every transaction to verify ownership and transfer of ownership. That's because it's dealing with two people and you need somebody in the middle to verify you're you and the other person is them and that this transaction happened and somebody's got to look after it. So in this centralized financial system, each account is private and holds the personal identity and the financial data along with all of their assets and holdings. So everything that you have, own, the cash you have, everything about your finance is known by someone and is held by someone other than yourself. And that includes your house, your cars, everything like that. So that's a centralized financial system. Sometimes the power from having access to all of these holding leads to abuse by the holders and the centralized data is always under the threat of being attacked. That's where all of the uh, fraudulent situations happen. Now also what happens is, is there has to be now a whole nother layer of regulation and oversight is added leading to even higher transaction costs. And so every transaction, as you can see, has a fee. Every time we move money, either from the bank or even writing a check, there's a fee, as you know, or you go to the credit card, you know, or even your debit cards, there's a fee. Your mortgage account, your CPA, all of this tremendous amount of money has to be spent on just tracking all of the money because it's all in a centralized system. But again, because that's there and can be hacked and gotten into, as you know, there's been lots of different things that happened, like 40 million cards were compromised from Target, 56 million cards from Home Depot. You know, credit cards were not designed for this day of the internet. We've got Russians and Chinese and everybody in the world hacking to get this information. And you know, right now, of course, your identity theft is a very big threat all around the world. Fraud and this cybercrime is just huge. Now, another thing that this can lead to by having all of this under so much control is a lot of greed. 
course, that's what happened with the last catastrophe. There's a lot of people think it's coming again, but you can see how much the Wall Street people make over the regular people. You can see how many bank failures there are. You can also see that in that last crisis, it turns out that 700 billion was just a small part of what it took to regain that. In fact, we, we almost had a complete financial meltdown, even though this was all controlled by people who were supposed to know better. They said that it could be as high as $12.8 trillion that that last crisis cost us, and we certainly don't want to go through that again. But a lot of that has to do with because we're running so much on debt and we're running on so much in derivatives. And I don't want to get into the whole economy of that, but we all know what that's like. In fact, if you look at Canada here, it's over $1 trillion in debt. For every man, woman, and child in the country, is $30,000 is owed just to make up for their debt. That's peanuts compared to the United States. That's $18 trillion in debt, and that's fifty-six dollars or $58,000 per person in the country. Even babies owe $58,000 the minute they're born, so they don't handle it very well. And of course, uh, no one's really trying to solve that problem. They say they're going to. But human nature is that you're going to stretch it to the outer limits. Well, it's really what's been happening with a lot of the countries in the outer limits. And you can see there that some of their debt is larger than their GDP. And in fact, Greece, as you can see there at 130%, that's the one that's falling, that's the domino. One goes down, the rest goes down. And right now, of course, many of the world economies are in very, very sad shape. And it all, again, has to do with this debt, financial control, who's controlling it, who's taking it, what are they using it for, and who is really benefiting from it. I don't want to be in a soapbox here. I'm just trying to get a point across. That's a centralized system. When we talk about decentralization, I just want to give you a couple examples. So the first one here is like the post office. When the internet came along, it changed everything. First of all, everything used to be handled by the post office. You'd move letters in, move them out, count them. It was all physical, and that's a centralized government system. And back then, it had to be done. But in 1994 was the first time really on TV, and that wasn't really that long ago, that the internet was even mentioned. And that's where this is, the, I like that ad where Katie Kirk is asking, you know, tell me what's the internet? And, and he was saying, what's that thing with the at symbol on it? That was 1994, they didn't even know what it was. Well, look what's happened since then. Email has taken over mail. The, the post office is having trouble surviving because they're competing with other places. But email is decentralized. It's right in the hands of the people. It's peer to peer. So re remember that phrase, peer to peer. And that's decentralized communication protocol. Now here's another example, the news. Before 1990, we had four stations and a limited number of uh, newspapers. And that was centralized, okay? They were able to bring in all the news and they were able to distribute it all out. So it was in and out. Well, now look what happens. Again, the internet's come along and it's decentralized. You can get news everywhere, online. You can have blogs, you have bloggers, you're not just news people, etc. Now it's power back to the people. That's what decentralization is. And in fact, it even goes beyond that. When you look at social media, that's another huge way of decentralizing. And you know, during uh, the, the Arab Spring and stuff like that, they were using social media. People were finding out things that they couldn't find before when the governments were hiding things from them. Well, when you go peer to peer and people have access to just getting online and finding out things directly from people, the whole thing changes. So again, we're obviously setting that up for now moving into the idea of decentralizing the payment system.